I didn't tell my wife because uh, it's crazy to tell your wife that, hey, let's run for Congress. Three days later, I couldn't shake it. Uh, I was still couldn't escape that thought of it. And I thought, I'm going to at least research the congressional boundaries in the district and how many people live there and just learn as much as I can. It's like, okay, God, okay, uh, at least learn a little bit about this kind of moment. And so I was reading through all that stuff uh, online. My wife walked in and she said, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm just looking at some county statistics. And I thought, I have no idea what she's about to say next. Because uh, she's going to say, that. what are you looking at county statistics for? But instead, she hesitated for a long time. And she said, we're about to run for Congress, aren't we? And I said, what makes you say that? And she said, I don't know. I just know. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Senator James Lankford, we are honored to have you on our podcast. You're a controversial figure with the national media, but in Oklahoma, the state you're representing in the United States Senate, you're getting 64 to 68 percent of the vote. So it's obvious you are representing your constituency quite well. I want to start by going back to your roots. Your childhood, from the outside looking in, was marked by three significant events. Your parents divorced when you were four or five. You're coming to Christ when you were only eight years old and your mother's marriage to your stepfather at the age of 12. How did each of these events come about and how do you feel they affected the man that you've become? That's a great question. I have to tell you, in many ways, I look at my life growing up in the uh, born. I was born in the late 60s, growing up in the 70s. It's pretty typical during that time period. I, um, I have to tell you, there were a lot of families of divorce. There was a lot of struggle that was happening during that time, as there is now. And for me and my parents, when they divorced, when I was four, my older brother was eight, I was four. Uh, mom was a school teacher, librarian, and was doing whatever she could to be able to help out and to be able to raise two boys and the challenges of that. She took us to church. Uh, it was one of the things that she wanted to be able to do. And uh, we went to a really, really big church, and she told me later on it was because she wanted to be able to go to church but still hide. And uh, so we went to church, and I was sitting in the balcony actually paying attention as an 8-year-old. That was a, a miracle in itself. If you uh, around 8-year-old boys that get an 8-year-old boy that pays attention <laughs> in church. And all I remember is that evening really coming to the conclusion, there is a God, and I don't know him. And as crazy as it sounds— I wouldn't have been sitting in that church if my parents hadn't divorced, uh, but I was sitting in that church listening at that time and was engaged enough to be able to realize, you know what? I really do need to know God. I didn't understand everything about God. I was eight years old, but it was a beginning point for me to understand that there is a God. I don't know him and I need that. So I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my life. And that was a revolution in many ways that occurred there. That's a lot of decisions I've regretted, a lot of decisions I wish I could do over in my life. That's one I've been grateful for my entire life is that decision. And then when my mom remarried when I was 12 years old, uh, my stepfather was much older. Uh, he had already raised two children, and he really wasn't that interested in raising more, quite frankly. And so though my mom remarried, it was still really my mom that was raising me during that time period. And uh, through middle school and high school and then on into college, uh, we stayed very, very close. And uh, continued to be close all the way up until she passed away just two years ago from Parkinson's. And I had the opportunity to be able to walk with her through that season together, uh, which was a sweet time for she and I. Was there something that happened when you were in the church at eight years old? Or did you did the did the you know, pastor say something that resonated with you or it was just being in the moment? Yeah. 
I, I think honestly, for me, when I when I came to Christ eight years old, it was just listening to a sermon. It, it wasn't anything particularly different about that sermon. Uh, it was just a moment for me to be able to realize that uh, I was separated from God. And uh, so it was the beginning point for me, quite frankly, of a now what is a lifelong relationship with Christ and trying to be able to grow in my own faith. I still read scripture every day, some in the morning, some in the evening. I still still spend time in prayer every day. I still have Bible studies that I attend even with other senators here, still involved in my own church and trying to be able to take in times of worship. So I, I wasn't complete in my journey in any way that that when I came to Christ was my beginning point. And then every day I seem to learn a little bit more about God and what that relationship is like and grow more in it, grow more fascinated with a relationship with God and uh, more confused on different issues, uh, but find a great peace in having the opportunity to be able to know him and to be able to know he has always had a plan for each of our lives. I think most people would say that it's a pretty young age to commit yourself to Christ. Were you just a precocious kid or did you have an adult in your life who was guiding you? That's a great question. When my parents divorced when I was four, my my mom uh, was very intentional to try to find men that would come into my life uh, to be an example and a role model. So getting involved in church, we got involved in some boys groups. I was involved in Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts at that time, Cub Scouts and Weeblows and Boy Scouts. Uh, I was involved in several different discipleship groups and our own Sunday school class there. Uh, she even put me into a class at our church that was teaching Taekwondo. Uh, so this skinny band kid uh, was in Taekwondo <laughs> at eight years old uh, because it was basically a, a Christian guy who was leading this Taekwondo group. And she was just trying to get me around other men to make sure that I had male role models around me. And uh, she was very intentional about that. And I was the beneficiary of it. Obviously, your church played a major role in your childhood. But did you play any sports or have any other interests outside of the church? So I, I did play sports when I was a young kid. I was a fabulous soccer player on the Green Hornets uh, soccer team when I was eight, nine, and 10 years old. I'm sure I was the best possible Green Hornet uh, during that time period. Uh, but the older I got, the more I realized I was still staying pretty skinny and all my colleagues and all my friends around me were certainly adding bulk and muscle and I was the skinny redheaded kid. Uh, I got very involved in playing in the band really enjoyed uh, being in the band. I was a drummer. Uh, I jokingly said, but it's really true. And people that are around band and drummers would know this. I was like the the rare drummer that actually went all the way through middle school and high school uh, playing percussion and never smoked marijuana the whole time. So I'm a really rare kid <laughs> in that. Uh, but I was just loved the group uh, environment. I enjoyed hanging out with other people in the band. I enjoyed marching band in the fall. Nah, concert season, not as much in the spring, uh, but it was really the relationships that I was building during that time period. Uh, what was funny was my mom was also a drummer uh, and she played percussion all the way through college, but she didn't ever tell me she was a drummer until I was a couple years into playing percussion because she never wanted me to go the same route. And so mm -hmm. later she told me that she was involved in that as well. So I always thought that was kind of funny that we took the same route and I didn't even know it at the time. Did you maintain the relationship with your father, too? You mentioned, obviously, stay in touch with your mom all the way through her, her battle with Parkinson's and growing up. But was your dad around? Uh, he, he was not around much, but we did develop a relationship and do stay in contact in contact. Uh, that, that's been something pretty frequent and it's been something he's been pretty open with me that he would like to spend even more time. Oh, that's great. Senator, how did you meet your wife and how did your group of friends define themselves? Well, I would tell you, my, my the I always smile when I think about this on how I met my wife, uh, because she has said for years we met our sophomore year in high school. I have said for years we met our junior year in high school. Uh, and that has been a debate for 25 years of our 32 years of marriage until seven years ago when she called out a volleyball game that she was playing in that I was sat in on to be able to watch. And I said, I remember that. And she goes, oh, you do? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, that was my sophomore year uh, when that <laughs> happened. So I suddenly realized, yeah, I was wrong for 25 years and I have admitted it publicly. We met in high school. We ran around with the same group of friends uh, in high school, went to two different churches, uh, but had a lot of the same friends there. We never dated in high school except for prom. We double dated to prom like she was the other girl in the double date. Uh, so I was with a different person. Her best friend actually is who I was uh, was going to prom with. 
Uh, she was with another guy that uh, is, we've always had kind of a funny story about it. Um, he was like a big, thick neck football player. With I always said he had no neck at all. Just his head was attached to his shoulders. He was just <laughs> such a big guy. And uh, so I've always called him Gunter, though that wasn't actually his name. Uh, but when we uh, actually started dating, actually, we were both working on our master's. We were in two different colleges. Uh, but we stayed in contact when we would come back home from college. We were around that same group of friends. We just stayed in contact. And then we were both working on our masters. We moved from long, long time friends to started dating. We started dating in March. Uh, I proposed in November and then we married uh, the following May. Uh, we've now been married 32 years. And I tell people all the time when they ask how long you've been married, my response is not long enough is how long we've been married. Uh, but technically it's been 32 years. Uh, we have two daughters now. Uh, that are Hannah and Jordan, and we are incredibly blessed. And uh, the, both the two daughters that we have and the gift of the marriage that's there. And I, I joke with my staff all the time uh, because they'll get engaged and then they'll have some engagement that's a year or a year and a half long. And I always smile at them and say, marriage is so much better than weddings, uh, that once you're engaged, get to the marriage because while weddings are fun, marriage is so much better. So it sounds like you and your wife had a, obviously a really long, great marriage. Um, what did you bond over when you first met? Because at first, you know, you're on a double date with other people. How did it, how did it switch over? That's a great question, actually. We, um, we, we really developed a friendship, obviously, for years uh, before we moved from friendship to romance. And I think the foundation of our marriage has really been that friendship that we enjoyed spending time together. Uh, I am still enjoy spending time with her. And uh, just amazingly, she still enjoys spending time with me as well. Uh, <laughs> our relationship with Christ, uh, our love for a lot of the same things, um, and just basically our calling to each other and to the task in front of us. Uh, she thought she was marrying a minister. Uh, you may know that I was a youth pastor for 22 years uh, before my life was totally interrupted and we ran for Congress together. Um, so w the funny part about it is that she thought she was marrying a minister and we were going to be a ministry as we were for two years. And now she ends up being the wife of a senator, but we're still doing <laughs> life together. And that's always been a, uh, a real challenge for us. And that is to make sure that we don't have two separate lives, uh, that we live both in the same house, that we're one family and we're actually functioning together. And so she knows my staff, she knows my days and my times. I know hers. And uh, we still spend a lot of time together, even when I'm on the road, uh, a lot of time on the phone, just catching up. You're listening to Tim Green's Nothing Left Unsaid. If you're enjoying the show, please rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us out. How did you end up getting your bachelor's degree in secondary education at the University of Texas? I would have thought theology or political science. All right. Now, now you're into controversy in my state of Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> pe people may like me in my state, but then they always cringe every time they think about the fact I went to the University of Texas. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that uh, become just a kind of a funny story in the state. When I first ran for politics, I'd never been anything in politics at all before. And uh, so when I was running, I met with somebody that does a lot of politics and their statement to me was, if you have any skeletons in your closet, get them out as early as possible because they're going to come out. And so I used to in my very first campaign, as I would travel to any campaign spot to be able to speak, I would say, OK, I need to get all this out. I've been told to get my skeletons out of the closet. So I need to go ahead and get all this out. I've never done drugs. I've been faithful to my wife but I did graduate from the University of Texas. <laughs> and in Oklahoma, people would just groan and would say, I wish you would have just done drugs. That would have been easier to be able to stomach than you went to UT. Uh, but I did, went to the University of Texas. I then later went to Southwestern Seminary and got a master's in divinity there. Uh, but for me, I started out as a business major uh, my first year. I really since I called to ministry. And so I talked to my pastor uh, when I was still in high school and said, what are the things that you wish you would have done? And, uh, and he said, I, you know, in ministry, I wish I'd have had more business savvy uh, because there's all the budgeting and things you have to do. You just never think about it in ministry. So I started that way and really didn't enjoy it and all my classes and struggle with it. Between my freshman and sophomore year, I transitioned over to secondary education because I love students and I just really enjoyed teaching. And uh, so really thrived in that. I uh, finished that out, got my degree in speech and history for my teaching fields and 
and then for 22 years from that, I was continuing to be able to spend time with students. I was never formally in a classroom other than my student teaching time, uh, but still enjoyed those principles that I was able to gain even from my bachelor's degree on how to teach students. I was just teaching scripture rather than just teaching history and other things. When and how did the Lord call you to be a Baptist minister? Be, being a minister to me um, really started as a, as a senior in high school. And I just felt this calling to be able to serve in any way that I possibly could. And quite frankly, I didn't know anyone in ministry. There was no one in my family in ministry. So I went to my pastor then. We talked about it for a while. And then he said, basically, just get involved and start doing something. Uh, so I got more involved. I was very involved in my church as a freshman in college. Uh, I got with a pastor that was there at my church at that time, and uh, he really mentored me a lot and then pushed me to just start experimenting. So folks had called me uh, in high school, even in early college and said, you have a great radio voice. And so you should do radio. And so the first thing I tried to do in ministry, quote unquote, was to be a DJ on a Christian radio station in Austin. And so I had the Friday night Christian rock program uh, at the Christian radio station. And everybody said, you should love it. And I absolutely hated it because I was in a little room, literally at that time, spinning vinyl. Uh, that was back in the day, uh, talking to myself in a microphone, not really able to have a lot of conversation with people. And I uh, did that for a season. And I thought, yeah, this is absolutely not it. And then started interning and working with students. Love that. A church that was in the Austin area actually asked me to come and join them on staff working with their students. Did that and just thrived and loved it. You know, that moment when you start doing something and you really feel God's pleasure to do that. It was that overwhelming sense for me and uh, continue to do that then for two decades after that. You mentioned it a little earlier, but you go from secondary education to a religious youth camp called Falls Creek. How did you find the job at Falls Creek and can you describe it for us? <clears throat> so the, the last 15 years I was in youth ministry, I was with the, a group called the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma. Uh, it's the coordinating organization for all Southern Baptist churches in the state of Oklahoma. And when I first came, I was working with students in one area. And after about a year and a half of being there, the director there asked me to take on the big project in our convention, which was running our state youth camp. Uh, the Falls Creek Youth Camp is the largest Christian camp in America. Uh, we have 51,000 students come every single summer. Wow. Uh, on Monday, uh, the camp is empty. We're setting everything up. By about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we'll have 5,000 people that will be there. And we, the students will be there from Monday until Saturday morning. <clears throat> they leave out on Saturday. We start cleaning, organizing, get some time to be able to rest, and then a new group comes on the next Monday. We do that all summer. And it's a really remarkable place to be able to do youth ministry because you're interacting with a lot of families and a lot of students. Uh, the way Falls Creek is designed is that uh, the adults from their home church come with them to camp. And uh, so a cabin will be set up, maybe has 50, stu uh, 50 students in it and about 15 adults uh, that will also stay there. They'll cook all their meals together. There's a kitchen in each cabin, so they're cooking meals. They're spending time together doing their own devotional. And then I'm also teaching in the morning as well as organizing all the rest of the recreation and everything else that's happening through the course of the day. So it's a really remarkable place to be able to do ministry that's been around more than 100 years as a camp. Uh, so I came to Oklahoma originally uh, to be able to lead on some of the student areas. I was asked to be able to take the leadership of Falls Creek and to be able to help in many ways to be able to grow it and expand the work of it. And I uh, was able to do that for 15 years and just loved it. Uh, again, there, there's a great privilege there of getting a chance to be able to work with so many students that are taking a moment to be able to get away from family, get away from life uh, back home in the summer to come hang out in a camp. Uh, for anyone who's been to camp before, you know, there's just something about getting away from home. You just think about things differently. And it was a moment that I used to always challenge students to say, you're away from home for a moment. I know you're working on your physical and your mental and your emotional and all those things. But have you ever considered, considered the spiritual part of life? And quite frankly, for a lot of students growing up, 13, 14, 15 years old, that's the first time for them to ever consider really the spiritual part of life. And they had an opportunity to be able to, on their own, to be able to think about that. And as a camp together for us to be able to spend time in worship, spend time in challenge, but to give people time to be able to slow down life and to be able to think about big things and what direction that they want to be able to go in life. Did you and your family live at the camp year round or was it just seasonal? What were some of the biggest challenges at that job? 
Well, the, the, the task at Falls Creek is challenging because you've got 5,000 teenagers in a very small area. And if you've got three teenagers in a small area, they're combustible uh, at any point. When you've got 5,000 teenagers, uh, you know there's just a lot of activity and a lot of energy and a lot of laughter and emotion and drama like crazy uh, when you've got that many people together all at one spot. And so part of the challenge of it was just managing that many students, that many places and all the all the issues that may come up and then recreation, movement of people, weather. If you're in Oklahoma in the summer, you're going to have severe storms that are going to come through. So you've got to make the call on trying to be able to manage all those things. But it's also managing the the order of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, we had a certain structure every year for the camp itself uh, that we did a three-year rotation of the themes. It didn't sound the same, but it was the general background on it where one year we would talk about doctrine. Who is God? Uh, what is he like on it? So you have a deeper uh, view on it. We'd have one year uh, that was really focused on how to be able to articulate your faith and what that looks like. Because for a lot of people, they have a faith, but they've never thought about how they're going to talk about their faith because it's so extremely personal. Uh, they're just challenged with that. So we'd have a year that we'd talk about how do you talk about your faith, something that is so incredibly personal. And then a third year was really on spiritual disciplines, things like uh, prayer and how to read scripture and some basic things from spiritual disciplines. And then we repeat those themes over and over again in different ways to try to get a balanced perspective. We did find a lot of students that came to the camp would come maybe six years uh, during their time growing up in middle school and high school. So they would come each summer because they'd had a good experience the previous year. But we also had about 20 percent of the people that came. They didn't have any church background at all. They came with a friend. Quite frankly, they were trying to get away from home for a week during the summer uh, or they were bored or they had a great friend that had gone the year before that said they had a good time. And so they invited them to come. And so we had this mix of people that might have been there three or four years in a row. They really knew what was going on. And we had 20 percent, which, again, when you've got a camp of 5000 people, that means you've got a thousand uh, students that are there that may have no background at all in any church never been to a camp before, and they're kind of learning their way through all this. Uh, so it, it is a it is an early morning to very late night. Uh, if you work with teenagers, you know they don't have the normal life schedule everyone else does. Uh, but trying to be able to organize studies that could engage with students and then trying to be able to keep things actually moving as well as uh, introduce uh, who Christ is to people that have never even thought about a relationship with God before made it really exciting and really challenging all at the same time. Could you tell us about the financial risk that you and your wife took transitioning from the youth camp to politics? Your first involvement was when you ran for Congress in 2010, and it was a near run thing, wasn't it? So in 2008 and 2009, um, uh, uh, unexpected thing for us, we, my wife and I both separately, and it's a super long story on it, but we really sensed a calling to run for Congress. Now, you've heard my story somewhat. There's no politics. There's no background in politics in my life. There's no one in my family that's involved in politics. But we really sensed a calling to do this. And we spent about six or seven months just praying and struggling with that, saying, God, this seems crazy that that this is what we feel like we're supposed to do. Uh, but after about seven months, I remember saying to my wife, I'm going to be an old man one day telling my grandchildren about the time I didn't follow what I felt like God was calling me to do. And I'd met people like that. Quite frankly, I'd met some men in their 70s and 80s that when I got to know them, they talked about something they felt strongly they were called to when they were younger and they were just afraid to do it. So they never did it. And now at 70 years old, 50 years later, they still regretted that they didn't really follow what they felt like they were supposed to do. And I said to my wife, I'm going to be like that guy. I'm going to be 78 years old telling my grandchildren about the time I didn't do what I felt like I was called to do. So I resigned my position as the director of Falls Creek. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, I could run for a political office and still lead a nonprofit, uh, but it also exposes them to all kinds of accusations. And so I just wasn't going to put them at risk. And so I resigned my position, lived off our life savings for a year, which, as you can imagine, as a youth pastor, was substantial to have a big life savings. Uh, but we basically lived off our life savings. My wife is a speech language pathologist. She took more clients on and I spent full time campaigning. And uh, during the summers, uh, my wife would take off and not take any patients during the summer and would just campaign out there full time. And we were really out there. 
uh, quite frankly. Uh, it was it was a pretty big stretch for us to be able to do that. We went through the year uh, from being a, an absolute unknown in anything in politics, just meeting as many people as we could, telling our story, talking about the issues that we thought were important to the country and important to the people in Oklahoma. And went all the way through that process, got to the primary itself. Uh, there were seven people uh, that were in the primary election, and I won the primary by 1%. Uh, but it wasn't wow. a big enough majority to actually not have to have a runoff. Uh, in my state, you have to have 50% plus one. So we won the primary by 1%, and then four weeks later had to have a runoff election, won the runoff election by 30%. Uh, so it was a big win. And then went on to the general election and won that one as well. We we felt really strongly this is what God had called us to do. And we had lots of nice people that kind of patted us on the head and said, well, you know, you feel like God's called you to, to run but not really be in the job. And I always just smiled at them and said, I, I hear what you're saying and I'm respectful of that. But we really feel like we're called to do the task and the campaign is the necessary job interview that leads to the task. But we feel like this is what we're supposed to do. And so we're preparing ourselves both academically and going through the studies and the policy issues and the preparation, uh, but also in the job interview portion of that. That's actually the campaign itself. But it was a it was a pretty big stretch for us financially and a pretty big reach for our family. And I have to tell you, when I posted on Facebook uh, that September 1st of that year, that I'm resigning my position and I'm running for Congress. We had an awful lot of friends that posted right back. Is this a joke? Or are you just being funny? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. Uh, actually, this is what we feel called to do. And a ton of them then posted right back or called me and said, well, if you're doing it, I want to help. And uh, we were really grateful for the number of people that jumped in right at the very beginning and said, I'm glad to be able to have somebody that I know, I know loves God, and I know is not in the political world that would jump in and be able to help. Senator, you mentioned that you felt the the call from God, but was there something, was there a sign or something that, that like, what was that call? Or did you just wake up feeling like you wanted to get into politics? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was no, uh, no writing in the clouds, no big booming voice from heaven that says <laughs> thou shalt run for Congress. There was, there was none of that. It was this overwhelming sense, uh, by the way, for about six months that we felt like God was saying, I'm, I'm get ready. I'm about to do something. And it was just this overwhelming sense, uh, which was exciting for about a month. And then another four or five months later, <clears throat> we thought, I, I don't know what to do with this. And it went from exciting to frustrating uh, to moments that I actually had in September uh, to be able to pray and say, God, I don't know what to do with this. I feel like you're trying to say something to me. And I don't know what you're trying to say to me. I, I can't figure this out. And I, I don't think I was looking for an audible voice, but I, I just felt this overwhelming sense that he was trying to say, get ready. I'm about to do something. <clears throat> Late that night uh, of having this prayer time with God to really say, I can't figure this out. Uh, I was reading through the online news late that night. And as I'm reading through it, there was a story that was there. And this was September of an election year. Uh, there was a story in there that uh, was the person that was in Congress at that time in the seat that I lived in. She was thinking about running for governor two years later. Now, she was running for re-election that September for a November election. But I'm just reading through the news on everything. And as I got to that story, there was just this overwhelming sense on me. That since God was saying, that's what I've been telling you to wait for. Is that right there? And I remember leaning back in my chair at home and saying, well, God, that's insane. That That's not even rational. Now, he didn't speak to me audibly, but it was just this overwhelming sense. And and, and I know this creeps some people out that thinks that this is super mystical. I, I, I just believe that when Jesus said, come follow me, my sheep know my voice. They hear me and they follow me. Uh, even things like the 23rd Psalm, uh, that the Lord is my shepherd. That he really means that. He really, I, I really believe that God guides our lives if we allow him to be able to guide our life. That It wasn't just a, a thing that he says, come follow me, but just kidding. I'm not going to really lead you. I think when he said, come follow me, he meant I'm going to guide you. And it was just one of those unique moments that was just an overwhelming sense of God saying, this is what's next. And as I struggle with that personally, to say, God, that's crazy. I didn't tell my wife because uh, it's crazy to tell your wife that, hey, let's run for Congress. Three days later, I couldn't shake it. I was still couldn't escape that thought of it. 
And I was back in the study of my house, our little tiny study there on the computer. And I thought, I'm going to at least research the congressional boundaries in the district and how many people live there and just learn as much as I can. It's like, okay, God, okay, uh, at least learn a little bit about this kind of moment. And so I was reading through all that stuff uh, online. My wife walked in to the study and our computer faces the middle of the room. And so she walked in and she could see over my shoulder and she said, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm just looking at some county statistics. And I thought, I have no <laughs> idea what she's about to say next. Because uh, she's going to say, that, what are you looking at county statistics for? But instead, she hesitated for a long time. And she said, we're about to run for Congress, aren't we? Hmm. And I said, what makes you say that? And she said, I don't know. I just know. Now, you'd have to know my bride. I mean, she's not politically engaged at all. And I said, OK, I, I need to tell you what I felt like God said to me three days ago. And I need to tell you the rest of the story while I'm looking at these county statistics. And we sat there for a long time and just talked about it and said, this is crazy that we both sensed this separately, that this is what we're supposed to be doing. And so we determined we're going to pray about this for a month. And I honestly thought, if you know the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac and the ram and, and uh, Isaac's being told to, you know, Abraham's being told to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah. And I thought, okay, this is going to be like, we're going to pray about this for a month. And then God's going to come back and say, thanks so much for being faithful, but you don't have to kill Isaac. And instead he was like, oh no, story's going to be different this time. This is really what I want you to do. This is not just being faithful, praying about a crazy thing. I really want you to do this. And he just continued to affirm over and over again, come follow me. This is what I want you to do. Since your winning bid for Congress, where you served for two terms before your successful campaign for the United States Senate in 2015, have you been able to impose your faith into your decisions as a representative of Oklahoma? Or do you try to keep those separate? Yeah, that's a really great question. And in some ways, it's controversial and not controversial. Uh, when the people of Oklahoma elected me, they, they knew who I was. I was very clear with them. I'm a, I'm a youth pastor. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm also passionate about American energy. I'm passionate about our economy. I'm passionate about tax policy, about immigration. I mean, there, there are things that are important to everybody on this, but they also know that there's a faith component in my life as well. And there are people of faith that supported me and people that don't share my faith that supported me. And I'm, I'm great with that. I represent all those folks. And in the Senate, I represent all 4 million Oklahomans. And I understand we don't all agree on all different faith areas. But I also understand that as a person of faith, I, I can't go to Washington and be something I'm not. Uh, that's like the worst case scenario is to say, well, I'm a person of faith at home. And in D.C., I take all that off. Uh, I firmly believe that your faith is your faith. You, you live your faith every single day or it's really your faith. If you only do faith like on Sundays, it's something you do on a weekend is called a hobby. That's not a faith. I don't, I don't have a hobby where my faith is not a hobby, something I just do on weekends. It permeates every relationship and every conversation, how I treat my staff, how I interact with people I disagree with, how I interact with my spouse and my kids and how I drive. I mean, your faith affects everything. And so for me, I continue to be able to live out my faith here. And I understand not everyone here shares my faith, but we're Americans. We have different faith. That right is protected. I protect their right to have a different faith or to have no faith, just like I expect them to respect my right to be able to have my faith and to be able to live my faith. So here in D.C., I'm involved in two different Bible studies uh, that are on the Hill with different groups of senators where we get together and be able to study scripture together. There's a historic bipartisan uh, prayer breakfast that happens on Wednesday morning that's been going on in the Senate since the 1950s. It's still going on. And uh, on any given Wednesday morning, early for breakfast, a group of senators get together. There's usually about 15 of us or so that pray together, sing a hymn together. One person will stand up and kind of talk about their spiritual journey of late. And we'll have the opportunity to be able to pray for each other's families and then spend some time encouraging each other. That's been going on for a very long time. It's a bipartisan gathering. And I think some people are shocked that that kind of thing is happening. But there is still faith that's happening here. Um, I, I have folks that have caught me early on and said, OK, D.C. is like Sodom and Gomorrah crazy. It's such a dark place. And I'll typically smile at them and say, well, at the end of Sodom and Gomorrah, God was pulling everybody out. Uh, but I don't see him pulling everybody out of D.C. He's still sending in people and God still cares about government and people. It's, it's not that we're a theocracy and I'm not looking to be a Christian nationalist to try to take over the country. But people of faith in our country want representation, just like people that share a different faith or have no faith on it. They ask for representation as well in our government. So people of faith have the privilege in our nation 
to also be able to speak out on things that are important to us. And so that's what I speak out on, as well as representing the many views that we have. I also, and this is just a side note for me, as a Christian, people at home know that I'm a Christian. I talk about it. And it's not that I drive it down everybody's throat, but I do. I am open to be able to talk about it. It's part of who I am. I'm also keenly aware that I want people to think and to know that if you elect a Christian, they're going to work hard. They're going to stay at the task. So I feel an, an extra obligation for me personally to study harder, to work harder at the issues, to be well-informed, because I never want people to ever think, don't elect a Christian because they can't get the job done. I want them to say, hey, I want to be able to bring people on that live their faith because they not only can live their faith and I'm not worried about their integrity, but I also know their job ethic and that we may not always agree on things, but I know they're actually working to be able to get things done. So I do feel the weight of that, but that's not something I have to feel like I have to carry all the time. I, I feel like it's uh, just a responsibility that I have in the middle of it as well. You have opposed same-sex marriage. Is this scripture-based? And if so, where? I'm not expecting chapter and verse, but generally. So I understand where we are as a, as a nation on the issue of same-sex marriage. I'm very respectful and understand there's a wide diversity of opinion on this. As I look at things from a, a biblical point of view, I go back to the very foundation of Genesis, actually, and God creating male and female. I, I, I see the relationship of marriage and the uniqueness of each individual is something that God actually created and has a purpose for. Um, God has a purpose for male and a purpose for female, uh, and that he is uh, loving in a million ways and demonstrates his affection for us in the creation of marriage. So when an individual tells me, hey, I, I was born male or born female, but I don't choose to do that, I want to do something different or whatever it may be, to, to me, I understand you, you have that right as an American to be able to live and choose to be able to live any way that you choose to be able to practice that. But I think from a biblical perspective on that, I think I, I, I wish you understood God's purpose and intent, uh, because I think it is good. Um, and so that that's that's where you deal with the balance of constitutional protections for individuals and a faith perspective of what I believe is is God's design for individuals. And I'm respectful of all individuals, and I would, I'm hopeful that they'd be respectful of me as well in that as we try to live with the tension of that as a nation. Senator, I am a Christian, not quite like you, because it took me a lot longer. I was lost, but now I'm found. And I agreed to do this podcast only if I could talk about religion in every conversation. I am about to ask some tough questions, so I want you to know we are on the same team, and I'm not asking any of these in bad faith. <laughs> that was part of his contract, Senator. He said he would only do the pod. One of my ways to get him to do the podcast was he had to be able to talk about uh, religion every episode. Did you call climate change a myth? And if so, have recent weather events led you to reconsider? And if not, what would motivate so many scientists to lie? I want to believe that you are correct, by the way, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, climate change is one of those really sticky, difficult issues that there's no question that the climate is changing. The question is how much human involvement is is engaged with that? Uh, what does that mean uh, for people in their shift of life? And what is it going to take to actually be able to turn this around? So I, I look at the basic science of this. Is it warmer now than it was 20 years ago than it was 50 years ago? Yes. Were there hurricanes 100 years ago, 200 years ago? Uh, yes, there were. In fact, many times there's a weather event where there'll be an extreme weather event that'll be a record that was broken. And I'll see this in Oklahoma or any number of th uh, places. They'll say, well, it's the hottest day of this day on record since 1930. And I'll go, well, OK, well, that was 100 years ago, basically. And we were still having days like this. So while you see climate change occurring and you see the different uh, warming in different areas, uh, the challenge is, okay, what is the man-made po portion of this? I, I look at some basic things on this. Much of North America was once covered by water. Uh, we had glaciers that were covering the northern part of North America. Much of Texas uh, was covered by the Gulf of Mexico, if you want to go back thousands and thousands of years ago. So we've clearly had major changes in climate over the history of the planet. So that's occurred naturally when the, you didn't have all the use of carbon fuels and everything else at that time. Now there's a lot more carbon in the atmosphere. There's methane. There's all the different greenhouse gas emissions that are occurring. They're also seeing some changes there. 
I feel a responsibility as a Christian to be a good steward of the planet. So I want to be able to reduce pollution, to be able to do what we can, to be able to take care of the earth that God has given us. That to me is a God-given responsibility. So let's do it as clean as we possibly can. But let's also not drive people into poverty or to be able to challenge the economy at the same time. We've got to be able to do both. So, for instance, uh, you look at what's happening in developing countries. There's a lot of folks saying, well, developing countries, they can't use oil and gas or coal at all because that's terrible for them and for the planet. But then it just traps them into deep poverty because they're not able to develop like we were in the United States, like Europe was able to develop. Uh, so I'm a very definitely an all the above energy guy. I think we make things as clean as we can possibly make it. We do wind, we do solar, we do hydro, we do nuclear, we do all those things. So being wise to be able to be a good steward, but also to be able to maintain that balance to make sure we're watching for the economy. Because if we basically create an economy where energy is so expensive, we can't do manufacturing. A lot of people in poverty can't afford electricity in their homes. Now we're actually hurting individuals as we're trying to be able to also be a good steward. So it's driving that balance. One, one more quick thing on it. I, I can distinctly remember my youngest daughter one day when she was about six years old, we were pulling out at an intersection and she said to me from the back seat of the car, she said, dad, is that car on fire in front of us? Because she saw this smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Now for a kid that grew up in the seventies, that was <laughs> just another car. And I realized She's never seen smoke come out of a tailpipe before. I grew up and that was a common thing on it. So we've made a lot of changes. Those are good changes to be able to make, to get cleaner air, to get cleaner water, to be wise stewards on it. But now we've got to also continue to be wise stewards of our days ahead of us to make sure that we're not hurting other people in the process of trying to be able to help the planet as well. So I think we just got to be able to strike the balance on it. I realize how much effort you must have put into that bipartisan border security bill that was effectively blocked by former President Trump by calling it a bad bill because it would give President Biden a political win. Looking back on it now, does it make sense? Yeah, another great question on that. that I ended up being in the thick of a conversation about how do we actually resolve the bad border situation. For context on it, uh, President Biden, he put in 94 different executive orders in the earliest days of his presidency to open the border. He stopped doing border construction on the border wall. He uh, changed a lot of the policies. He removed the Remain in Mexico policy. He basically signaled to the world, hey, the border's open. And so the world said, I'm excited. The border's open. I'm coming. And we saw this rapid move from half a million people a year that were illegally crossing to our border. Now, two and a half million people. We've had in three and a half years, more than 10 million million people that have illegally crossed the border. That th That is more in three years than the previous 12 years combined. Now, I serve on the Intelligence Committee and also serve on the Homeland Security Committee. I've spent a lot of time on our southern border talking to Border Patrol and the different folks. I spent a lot of time in intelligence briefings trying to track who's coming. By October of 2023, we were reaching epic high numbers on it. At the same time, we were seeing individuals that were coming in that were ISIS affiliated that were coming across our southern border. More and more people that were criminal connected coming across our southern border. <clears throat> people coming in from jails in Venezuela and from Nicaragua and from other places. We also started seeing a lot of other countries outside of the Western Hemisphere. People from China, from Russia, from Pakistan, from West Africa, and a lot of folks, we have no background, no connection, no way to know if they're fleeing poverty or if they're fleeing justice in their country. Those were the folks that were coming across our border in higher and higher numbers. I saw this as an existential threat to our nation. So I, I was very clear. I'm willing to work with anybody who is willing to be able to make this stop. We've got two and a half million people illegally crossing our border this calendar year. I want to make that stop. And so I sat down and negotiated with two other people, an independent from Arizona, Kirsten uh, uh, Cinema, and then also from um, uh, Chris Murphy, who's a progressive from Connecticut. And my decision was to be able to sit down with them and to say, okay, where can we find common ground on this? And we spent months just negotiating it out, trying to be able to find a way to be able to get to common ground on things and then brought that forward in February. I felt like I had a lot of support on it. Uh, it, it 
didn't get finished in December, which was our hope. It got finished in February. By that time, we were already in the presidential election cycle. Obviously, President Trump and several others were saying, hey, this is the single biggest issue in the election is President Biden's open border. And it is, for many Americans, the single biggest issue. And so I just determined <clears throat> my job is national security. I'm going to do whatever I can uh, to be able to help the national security. I understand the president's running for election. His job is working on election. I'm very respectful of that. I hope he wins. I'm, uh, I'm very much hopeful that he wins the election. I want him to be able to do that. But I was going to do whatever I could to stop another 2 million people from illegally crossing the border this year. And so I worked through the process on that, and we ran right into a lot of controversy in my own party of people saying, hey, do we solve this? Yes, we should solve it. But do we solve it right now? My issue was if we can stop 2 million people from coming across the border, we should do it right now. Uh, there was also a lot of misinformation that came out uh, on the bill, and that was one of the most painful parts of it. Uh, I joke with people all the time, my number that was always said during that was 5,000, uh, that there were folks that said the bill allowed 5,000 people a day to illegally come across the border, which is factually not true. The way the bill was set up is it changed the definition for asylum. So the very first person that came across the border every day was arrested. They were quickly screened with a brand new screening process, and then they were deported because very few people would get through that screening process. So the very first person that crossed would be arrested, would be quickly screened, and would be deported. But if you got to 5,000 people crossing a day, it overwhelms the system. And so instead of arrest, screen, deport, we would just arrest, deport. There would be no screening in the process. We would just turn everybody around if you got to 5,000. That was what the 5,000 number meant. Instead, it was twisted to be able to say it's actually letting 5,000 people in a day. It was never letting in 5,000 people a day. It was focused on the very first person being screened and deported. But if you got to 5,000, we changed the rules and basically took away due process and said, we can't handle this many people. We're going to turn everybody around. I understand it was controversial. But frankly, um, we had, I'll, I'll just say it, we had a young lady that was murdered in Houston uh, just a few weeks ago now uh, that the people that murdered her had crossed the border in May. Those folks would not have been able to cross the border. That murder would not have been carried out if the bill would have actually passed in February. I understand the politics of it. But for me, I'm looking at the national security side of it as well, saying my first responsibility is to make sure we're doing whatever we can to be able to secure the nation and the spot that we're in right now. And I'll continue to be able to work on that. And I'm willing to work with anybody who's willing to do it. Was the bill perfect and everything we wanted? Nope. It's in the Senate. In the Senate, you've got to have 60 votes, which means I've got to have Democrats and Republicans that have got to be able to join it. That's what makes this hard is when you've got to have both Democrats and Republicans to be able to be a part of something. But if we're going to get something done, that's the only way that we're going to get it done is getting both sides to be able to come to an agreement on it. So I'm going to keep doing what I can to be able to get both sides to come to agreement. Senator, you, like most conservative Christians, would outlaw abortion. Forgive me if I am mistaken, but haven't you said that life begins at conception? And if that's true, then it stands to follow that you wouldn't allow for any exception, including rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Is that correct? And if so, what scripture would you use to support the view that life begins at conception? I, I've been personally very, very outspoken for the value of every single child. I think every child is valuable. There aren't some disposable children and some valuable children. I think every child is valuable. And right now we're defining the value of a child based on the what a person declares is the value of that child rather than looking at the reality. So I start with some basic things. I start with the science. Uh, and when you look at the science, uh, every single cell in a woman's body from her fingernails and her liver and her toes and her nose all has the exact same DNA. But when she's pregnant, from the very moment of conception, there are some cells that have different DNA, DNA that's different than the mom's, different than the dad's, different than any other human being on earth. That's a unique new person that is there. And that can be shown by the science that there is different DNA in those cells. That's not just something attached to a mom. That's a person. The only difference between a child at conception and a child at birth is time. That's the only difference. They're, they have cell division. They have growth. All those things. I am 40 weeks older than I was 40 weeks ago. I've grown and changed as an individual with cell division and all those things, but I'm still a person. 
I don't see a difference in that child. And one of the things that I'm very focused on is just talking to people about this reality of the value of every single child. And, and I'm very respectful. I, I understand. I, I don't find a woman that is flippant about abortion. These are big, hard decisions uh, that a woman would make often because they've been abandoned by some guy or because of the season of life and they're afraid and whatever it may be. I'm very respectful of that. But I'm also in, very respectful in the conversation to say every time you talk about abortion, it's because there's a baby in the mix here. And we've got to be able to figure out where do we value children in that. If we've got two women walking down the same street on both sides of the street, uh, one woman is 16 weeks pregnant. She's headed to her office and they're having a baby shower that day at her work. They're going to talk about, you know, names and they're going to talk about clothes and diapers. They're going to talk about how hard it is to install a car seat they're, they're, because she's 16 weeks pregnant and they're going to start all that dialogue. Another woman, 16 weeks pregnant, is walking down the same road, but she's headed to an abortion clinic and she's actually going to terminate that pregnancy. What's the difference between those two children? There, there's no difference in their development and their timing. It's just a declaration that one is convenient and one is not. As far as the exceptions, the hardest part of the conversation, talking about all the exceptions is kind of like talking about the Middle East and saying, let's talk about Jerusalem and where that's going to go first. Uh, the, ex the exceptions are, are the hardest part about this. And I've been pretty outspoken to say I believe in every single child is valuable, but also understand that's not where most Americans are. Um, most Americans are in a spot that they're going to say, hey, I at least one exception for rape and, ex and, and incest. I've been very outspoken to say you've got to at least have an exception that's dealing with the life of the mother. You wouldn't have a situation where you're going to have a mom die and try to save that child unless there's no way to save the mom, unless there's some other illness or something that's actually going on with that. So the, the life of the mother exception is true in every single state, including my own state. So that I've been very outspoken for. The hard part is, and, and this is just for me, it's a personal thing. I have a longtime friend of mine that he was actually born as a child of a rape. He's an adult now. He's been an amazing guy, but he knows kind of his own past and his own history. So while some people talk about that issue as an exception, and that is an exception in most states, I also know the other side of that story. I, I know somebody that that is actually their life story and see that. So for me, I'm respectful of all the debate and I want to do in law whatever we can do to protect as many children as we can. Americans are not at the spot to be able to say, hey, we're going to we're not going to allow all these exceptions. But we are at the place already to be able to say we don't do partial birth abortion. We banned that years ago and said that's abhorrent. We're not going to do that. We are at a spot to say we don't like late term abortions. Americans are at the spot to say we don't like federal funding for abortions. All those things are just a cultural conversation for us. I think the more that we talk about the value of children, and I think we actually should talk about it, the more that we just need to have that dialogue and to continue to be able to come to consensus. And, and simply, simply put it like this for me, take a little history. 105 years ago, my wife and my daughters could not vote. And that was normal in America 105 years ago that my wife and my daughters could not vote. Now I'll look at that now and say, well, that's crazy. I can't believe there was a time in the history of the United States that we didn't allow women to be able to vote. So we look back at that time and say things are very different now than what they were 105 years ago. I look at the cultural conversation about the value of every child and to say, let's just fast forward. Let's keep talking about this as a nation. A hundred years from now, could we be at a spot that we look back at the time right now and to say there was a time in America that we thought some children were valuable and some children were disposable? If they were inconvenient, we would throw them away. I, I think 100 years from now, we're going to look back on this season and say, I can't believe we did that. Just like I look back 100 years ago and to say, I can't believe there was a time we didn't allow women to be able to vote. Don't, don't you think, though, Senator, that part of that is well, a large part of that is like the mother, the situation of the mother, if if a, if women were forced to have the children that say they didn't want. I'm just to be, I guess, clarify where I'm at on it. I don't, I don't exactly know where I, I definitely against any kind of late term abortion, but yeah. I also am fearful of bringing a child into a house where the parents don't want them. And I don't know enough about the subject to know when that cutoff point would be. Yeah. I, I know it's, you know, to me, it's, it's later than six weeks, but it's a heck of a lot before 20 weeks, but I don't know where that is. And that's, I think that's the, the million dollar question with this subject. But the part that scares me is if you have, if you not, if you take away that option, 
and it, and it shouldn't be an option just willy nilly. Right? I agree with that. But if somebody, you know, what's what's worse, I guess, um, you know, having a child that in a family that they aren't going to be loved or supported, or they can't afford to, you know, literally financially or emotionally or the situation they're in. That's the challenge for me. And when I hear somebody, you know, I don't know, that, that's the that's part that makes it a yeah. tough subject for me. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There, there's no doubt this highly emotional, very difficult uh, conversation. That's why I'm so respectful uh, that we should be very protective of this dialogue and to be able to make sure that we really are having an honest dialogue with people. I, I don't want to try to compel anyone in any way, but we also don't want to stop the dialogue. Most people that I talk to, I'll, I'll have just a very simple statement. I'll say, when do you think life begins? A lot of people have never thought about that. They think they think pro-choice, pro-life. They think reproductive freedom. They use all these different euphemisms. But I'll try to stop and I'll say, okay, when do you think life begins? Is it at birth? Uh, if it's at birth, is it 10 minutes before birth? Is that child alive at that point? Is the child alive a, an hour before birth? Are they alive a week before birth? Uh, is it at viability, uh, which is about 21 weeks now? Or is it uh, when they feel pain, uh, when the nervous system is developed at 15 weeks? Is it at a heartbeat at about six weeks? Is it at conception? And I, I really am respectful in that. I want to be able to have that dialogue with folks because a lot of people have not had time to be able to think about it because we mm -hmm. as a culture don't force that kind of conversation. And so I want to be able to hear people out and also understand that some people grow in this, uh, that they think about it longer and they think, well, wh why did I pick 20 weeks? What, why is that suddenly where they're alive? Or why did I suddenly pick birth that they're alive? But 10 minutes before they're sucking their thumb, they're pushing their feet, they're, you know, pushing their elbows and everything in the womb. Are they not alive at that point? Well, yeah, they are. Uh, so for me, it's just maintaining that dialogue. I, I think legally we're going to have exceptions for a very, 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 very long time, maybe forever as a nation on that. But I think we should also talk about what does it mean to actually have a child that's alive? Uh, we should never say this child's going to be expensive or inconvenient, so we should just kill them. I just don't want to be that as a culture. Uh, we should have a culture of adoption. We should have a culture of fostering. We should have a culture where families gather around other individuals. I think we should continue to provide contraceptives. We could continue to provide education, continue to provide tax treatments that are actually facilitating and helpful for families. So there's a lot of things that we can do to be a culture of life, to be able to make sure that we're continuing to be able to encourage that. And again, Super hard, super difficult conversation that I want to be respectful of everyone in the process on and to know there's a difference between where we have enough votes or where we're actually having real honest dialogue with each other to just be able to talk about an issue and say, let's not talk about votes and legal policy. Let's just talk about where we are as individuals and to see where we as a culture go. Senator, just to, to, to clarify, I guess my stance on it is I'm in full agreement with you that the, the question that we need to figure out is when when does life start because there has to be a yep. moment it, no one yep. i don't think whatever majority of people would say eight months right but i think majority of people yep. wouldn't say it's life on at uh conception maybe they were i, I don't know that's my that'd be my guess is somewhere in between but the thing that i love about what you're saying is is you and i disagree about this but your the dialogue is the key in my opinion too because i think even what how you just framed that how you just made your point about well, are we, what makes this child not valuable and that one valuable? I've never thought about it in that context before. And just, you know, having that dialogue, I think is the, is the most important part and what we're not doing enough of today. So anyways, I appreciate we can, we can move on because the time, I know we got time constraints. Yeah, but, it's getting away. Um, yeah. Thank you for that perspective. Senator, I don't want to let you go without giving you the opportunity to tell us about your daughters. This is your chance to brag without recourse. So I appreciate the question on it. There are a few people I'd rather talk about other than my wife and my daughters on it. Say the least, my wife is a very good, very gifted speech language pathologist that she ends up with a lot of the hardest cases and does just a phenomenal job. It's just a very gifted uh, leader in that area. And uh, so incredibly proud of her for that. Uh, my daughters are pretty remarkable as well. Uh, they have a great mom and a great role model uh, that's ahead of them. Uh, my oldest daughter is actually involved in ministry, and uh, she has the opportunity to be able to share her faith and to be very engaged uh, in sharing her faith and loves doing that and has thoroughly enjoyed uh, her time getting a chance to be able to serve on a church staff. And uh, so that's been really fun for her. and It's been great to be able to watch her continue to be able to grow in her own faith and to be able to learn more and more about how to share it and minister to other people. 
my youngest daughter is a therapist actually that works in a mental health and uh, substance abuse facility, uh, helping people at some of their hardest moments of life. Uh, when they hit a really, really tough moment and they end up in inpatient treatment and now they're trying to be able to restart their life. And so they both ended up in really tough places, uh, helping people in really tough moments. And uh, I'm incredibly proud of both of them and what they've chosen to be able to do. And uh, so grateful for the question because any chance I can get a chance to be able to brag on them, uh, I'll take it openly. Now on to our final word segment where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Wow. Uh, so I would say a couple of things. Uh, obviously, when I came to Christ and when I stood at the altar with the most beautiful woman in the world it was a pretty remarkable moment. What is the biggest adversity you faced? Oh. <laughs> I, I've had a stack of them, unfortunately, uh, but as everybody does, um, obviously, uh, growing up uh, with my parents' divorce and some of the challenges growing up was an adversity. God was my protector through that. Uh, I've had multiple challenges uh, with health in some of the issues around my daughter. And uh, we've walked through the, uh, through all that together. Uh, through elections are not fun. Uh, they may look fun from the outside. They're not much fun from the inside. Uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of engagement, a lot of stress that you go through. Uh, and then working on major pieces of legislation is always a challenge. What are you most excited about? Wow. So I'm excited about taking on hard things, actually, and getting them solved. We've got to solve national debt. Uh, we've got to solve the border crisis. Uh, we've got to solve Social Security, Medicare, Med Medicaid. Uh, there are some big, hard issues um, that we can't leave unresolved. Uh, and so as painful as it sounds, it's going to be really hard going through it. But I'm looking forward to, to getting those things solved and then getting past it. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I would say a couple of things to that, and I'll try to make it fast on it. I, I think Washington, D.C. is a mirror to the country more than the country wants to admit. We're a representative republic, uh, which means when people look at Washington, D.C., they think this is a crazy, dark place and people yell and scream at each other. And I say, well, D.C. is actually a mirror to the country. We elect people that think and look like us. So when we look at D.C., it is us. So I think one of the challenges that I have for people is if we're going to change the country, Washington doesn't change the, change the country. The country changes Washington. And so mm -hmm. I'm always encouraging folks to say, what can you do to be able to influence for good in your family, in your community, to be able to make changes there? Because if you can make changes there, you're changing the country. And if you're changing the country, you're turning around people and turning around the nation. So I, I just encourage people to not look at D.C. as some crazy something different, but to understand it really is the mirror to our country. And if we don't like what we see in the mirror, then we've got to be able to work on what's happening locally. People shouldn't sit back and say, I voted. There's nothing I can do. Uh, people should say, OK, what can I do personally to make a difference, to be able to be a good example, to be able to be a role model? That's what I think will be able to really make a difference long term in our country. If we're going to be we the people, then let's actually be we the people and let's actually affect our neighbors in our neighborhood. Senator James Lankford, it's been not only a pleasure, but an honor to get to know you. I have to give a shout out to our mutual friend, Lane Wilson. May God continue to bless both of you and your families. Please keep up your very inspirational work, sir. And thank you for spending some time with us. Tim, I would say the same to you on it. Uh, thanks for being such an inspiration, for raising such a great family, and for being such a great example on this. It is a challenge for every single person uh, to be able to try to live authentically and to be able to uh, try to make a difference and to help people in the way that we have the opportunity to. So I'm grateful to be able to have the privilege to be able to serve. I understand full well that I have this title of senator for a season. Someone else will have it after me. I'm a steward of this responsibility to be able to do what I can right now in the season that I'm in this chair and the season that we're in in our nation uh, to be able to help. Same as what you're doing and what your family's doing. So I, I'm with you as well. I'm a fan of Lane uh, as a mutual friend, and I'm glad that he had the opportunity to be able to connect us and uh, pray blessing on you and your family as well. This is the real last question, Senator, and then we'll let you go. <laughs> the, when we started the podcast, um, one of the things that was important to us, we wanted to talk to just interesting people with interesting backgrounds. Didn't matter what you know, from what walk of life. I didn't want my dad was in the NFL. 
I didn't want to get pigeonholed into a football podcast or we're trying to raise money and awareness for ALS. I didn't want to be an ALS podcast. So we ask every guest that we have on, uh, who are a couple of people that you know that you think we should have on the podcast next? Oh, wow. Uh, so you've, you've interviewed a bunch of really great people. I've been honored to be able to be a part of the dialogue because I've seen a lot of the different interviews that you've done on, and there's some great folks that have been a part of it. Uh, I would encourage you to get a chance to visit with a CEO of a company called Intel named Pat Gelsinger. He is a super interesting, very creative guy. Uh, he has a passionate faith personally, and he leads one of the largest companies in the world. And he's just really amazing in the things that he works on, that he talks about in his own personal life of engagement. So here's my shout out to Pat. If you get a chance to be able to join this podcast, I would encourage you to take the time to do it. Thanks so much, Senator. It was great. Uh, like my dad said, it was great getting to talk to you for a little bit and uh, getting to know you better. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I really enjoyed the time. Sorry that we were crunched in the technical issues. By the way, if you do end up talking to Pat, he's a remarkable believer. And uh, what he's doing in Silicon Valley is pretty cool. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecorps.com. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.